Hi, I'm Jimmy. In this video, we're going to walk through what the Federal Reserve has done to help the economy move forward and how it's possible that, thanks to all of their help, the Fed could actually be creating a bigger problem or a bigger bubble than we would have otherwise had. So first, I think it makes sense to look at what the Federal Reserve does and then what they've done to that could actually help the economy, the good side of what they've done, and then the possible impact of it and how it could all collapse. Okay, so the Fed has a few different tools that they use to help the economy. They have for many years, and their goal is to try to keep the economy on the right track. First, they set the discount rate. We might have also heard this called the Fed funds rate. And basically, this is the interest rate that banks can borrow, commercial banks, uh, can borrow from each other on a short-term basis, usually overnight. Or they can borrow from the Fed, the federal bank, at the very same rate. Next, the Federal Reserve sets something known as reserve requirements. Reserve requirements are how much money the Federal Reserve requires that banks keep on hand, either cash in their vaults or, more than likely, uh, deposits at one of the Federal Reserve banks. Okay, so the third primary tool that the Fed uses is something called open market operations. Open, op open market operations are when the Fed buys or sells securities from banks or to banks. Usually it's government bonds, but we'll come back to this in a minute. Okay, let's look closer at how the Fed uses each of these tools to try to improve the economy today. First, we have the discount rate. Now, like I said before, this is known as the Fed funds rate. And this is what the Fed funds rate has looked like going back to the mid-1990s. Now, we can't really see it here because the current rate is set to zero, but this line actually extends a little bit further. If it looks like it's at the same level as it was post-financial crisis, it's not. It's actually lower. Right now, it's set to zero. So, we can see that that's the lowest rate we've set in this time period. So, why does the Fed lower interest rates when the economy gets in trouble? Because we can see they lowered it just recently as we're as the current economic situation came upon us. But we might notice this isn't the only time they've dropped rates. To illustrate, this red line here, this is when the U.S. economy entered a recession coming through the tech bubble. And as we can see, the Fed had already begun lowering interest rates as the economy began to struggle. The same is true back here during the financial crisis. And once again, the coronavirus hit, so they did it again just recently. So clearly this is a trend, and each of the previous times that the economy's gotten into trouble, the economy recovered partially due to the Fed lowering interest rates. So I'm not sure that there's fundamentally anything wrong with lowering the rate. It is typically what they do. It is a logical thing to do because the theory is, is that it would lead, it's supposed to lead to more people and businesses being able to borrow money, which leads to more spending, which in theory brings back the economy. So this is logical. And by itself, it shouldn't be too much of a concern for now. Now, I do want to point out that we are at 0%, and that is something new. There are many countries around the world that have negative interest rates right now, and it's very difficult to tell the long-term implications of this type of interest rate policy. So I'm not sure how long all of this will be sustainable, but if this is only here for a short period of time, call it a couple of years, well, it's very possible that this shakes out to be okay. Beyond that, it could get a little bit sketchy. Okay, now this is where it gets interesting. Now we're shifting over to reserve requirements. So before the pandemic hit, this is what reserve requirements were. So the smallest banks didn't have to have any reserve requirements. Mid-tier banks had to have at least 3% reserve requirements, and the largest banks, they required a 10% reserve requirement. Now I'm super simplifying this. There are many exceptions as to the type of account to meet these reserve requirements, what type of account do they have, where the bank gets the money to keep on hand, but Broadly speaking, we could just say high-level breakdown, this is what it looked like before the most recent economic collapse. Now, if we were to update these numbers, well, now we can see that each of the tiers went down to 0%. This is a 0% reserve requirement. Now, again, this isn't true for all banks or all types of banks or all types of accounts. There are some exceptions to it. But broadly speaking, this is true. By the way, if you're curious, I got this data right off the Federal Reserve's website. So, what does this mean for the economy? Well, the purpose of the reserve requirement is that, in theory, deposits get made into a bank. So let's imagine that $10 gets deposited into a bank. Well, if the reserve requirement was 
well, then the bank is able to loan out the other 90%. They must keep 10% back, in this case, $1. And the $1 staying with the bank is very important and very good for the bank because if somebody needs to borrow money or something happens and the bank needs cash, the bank will always have some cash on hand. Now, in theory, if the bank, if the Federal Reserve lowers reserve requirements to zero, like they did recently, well then, now that bank can loan out that additional money. So now they loan that out, and now, in theory, there's more money in the economy. You had money, we had money, we deposited into the bank, they loaned 100% of that out, so now somebody else has that money, and by the way, we still get credit for it in our bank account. That's why if you ever hear banks uh, create, create money, that's how it's done. Now, we may be beginning to notice that there are some glaring holes in the Fed's plan. But we'll come, back to this sec we'll come back to that in a second because that's really on the negative side of all of this. For now, let's shift over to the third tool that the Federal Reserve has, and that is open market operations. So open market operations have existed for a long time for the Federal Reserve. This is a chart going back to the 1990s where we can see that the Fed on their balance sheet had almost a trillion dollars of assets on their balance sheet leading up to the financial crisis. Now, during that time there, well, the Fed mostly used open market operations to try to help control uh, interest rates to make sure that there was enough cash in the system. And generally, they bought and sold mostly only government bonds. But then the financial crash hit and banks were in a lot of trouble very fast. So the Fed jumped in and started buying not just government bonds, but also mortgages. Banks had plenty of mortgages. They had the paper for plenty of mortgages on hand. So the Fed began buying those up and put that cash back to the banks. So now the Fed owns the mortgages. They own the debt. And the banks now have the cash, in theory, allowing the banks to get money into the system and hopefully help spur the economy forward. And this action by the Fed was one of the things that st helped stabilize the economy, the economy in the financial crisis. And I'm sure we may realize that in probably 10 years after the financial crisis, the economy did fairly well. And that was at least partially due to what the Fed stepped in and did. Should they have done it for as long as they did? That's a different story. But either way, this is probably a good point to shift over to the dangers of what the Fed is bringing to the table. So sticking with the Fed and their, their open market operations, well, we can see here that once the economy got in trouble, well, the Fed once again started buying up assets again. And this was after a short stint where they began to reduce their balance sheet. But this time, the Fed also began to buy bonds. Initially, they said that they were just going to be buying investment grade bonds, and then they expanded that to at least some non-investment grade bonds. Now, this is fairly new for them, and on one hand, it's a logical move to make, and on the other hand, it's actually quite dangerous. Now, this is logical because this allows the Fed to essentially skip over the banks and give money directly to companies, or figure out a way to invest in companies directly. The fear, the reason that they would do that is the fear is that the credit markets will dry up, and that it would be a tragic thing for the overall economy things would get much, much worse if credit dried up and not just banks, but businesses couldn't get money. So the Fed stepping in and buying bonds, well, in theory, it keeps the wheels turning and it keeps money rotating through the economy. But one danger of this is that what if investors continue to lean on the Fed to buy bonds and mortgages? They haven't stopped buying mortgages either and government bonds, well, that's a ton of pressure on the Fed to, to continue to be the primary turner of the wheel of, for the economy. And that's dangerous for the economy where, in an economy where the Fed doesn't have to be that involved. They could be a bit more hands-off than they are. I get why they're, they're doing it. These are somewhat unprecedented times. So the logic behind needing to infuse ca capital into the system, I understand but it's gonna to have to be super temporary for this not to be an enormous problem once things look like they could come back. And now when we look over at reserve requirements, well, to me, this is actually one of the bigger red flags out of everything that they're doing. So right now, reserve requirements are down to zero, at least for the majority of situations. Well, in order for that to work, the government really needs for the economy to keep moving forward because if there were ever a big problem that wasn't foreseen, or if there was a run on the banks, or if 
banks uh, needed cash because they were on the verge of collapse. There was a collapse in the mortgage market or, or in the bond market or whatever it was. If something were to happen, the banks are going to need a ton of cash fast and the Fed is going to be the only one left to put it up. And if there's any political pressure or a change in the stance for, you know, if there's a new Fed chair or something along those lines, and there's a change as to how it should be handled, well, it's possible that the economic system at that point is so fragile that it can't afford any problems in the near term. So I think this is something that we really need to watch. Again, I think it's something that they can only do fairly short term. So now we ask the question, do we think that the economy is going to implode? Well, I know that there are many impressively passionate points of view on this topic, but I actually think that this whole thing is way more in the gray area than we're giving it credit for. If we look at any one piece of data, yes, by itself it looks like it could be dangerous. And I left interest rates off of the danger zone list because I'm not sure how much of a factor, yes, combined with the other two that could be a problem, but they've done this many times and it's very possible this doesn't end up being a problem if they can increase it at some point in the next few years. So. That being said, there are more unintended consequences with, I believe, the, the open market operations and setting the reserve requirements as low as they've set it. For example, right now, inflation hasn't been much of a problem. And over the past two decades, it hasn't been much of a problem. And we even saw a dip in inflation just recently when the economy began to struggle. And that's normal. Typically, when you get high unemployment, well, it's very unlikely that you're going to get high inflation. Usually, inflation falls just like it did. But let's imagine that the economy does get back on track, and maybe it's happening a little faster than we expected. Does inflation begin to tick higher quickly? There's been a ton of money added to the system from the Fed, so it's very possible that we suddenly see inflation starting to rally higher faster, and that could end up being real dangerous too. If that happens, well, now the Fed has to raise interest rates to try to combat inflation and, in theory, slow down the economy. And if that were to happen anytime soon, the economy is not exactly booming just yet. So this could be a no-win situation. And I do think that that's one of the dangerous scenarios that could play into some of the fear behind what the Fed is doing. Now, the flip side of this is that the economy gradually comes back. And in gradually coming back, something like inflation might tick a little bit higher, more slowly as unemployment begins to fall and the Fed can begin to normalize some of their more recent policies at a reasonable pace. Well, if that happens, it's very possible that the dance can go on a bit longer. Recently, I heard Buffett, uh, he said on a call, or actually I think it was an interview that he was doing, that it's tough to tell what's going to happen with the Fed and we don't really know the long-term consequences of their policies just yet. But for now, he's just trying to keep his head down. Basically, he said he's trying to keep his head down and wait for good investment opportunities as opportunities present themselves. To me, this is the smartest reaction. I think we should all watch what's going on with a critical eye and look for good investment opportunities. This is one of the main reasons that I like doing the monthly economic indicator analysis that we do on this channel because it really makes me sit down and look closely at what's happening with the economy and try to see if there's some opportunity somewhere. And hopefully we can use that information to help guide us as to what we should do next. Now, if you haven't seen that video, perhaps our most recent video on the economic analysis of the US economy is a good next video for you to watch. If you're curious, I got a link right here. I got a link in the description below. And thank you so much for sticking with me all the way to the end of the video. I really appreciate it. Thanks, and I'll see you in the next video.